Hello, and welcome to this special edition of Knowing Neurons. I'm Kate Bellhaber, and I'm here with Lynn Kjorps, who is Collegiate Professor at New York University. Welcome, Lynn. Thank you, Thanks. Kate. Thanks for speaking with me today. I'm so excited to hear about your research and life as a neuroscientist, so let's just dive right in. Okay. Can you tell me a little bit about your work? What are the major questions you're trying to answer in your lab? So the question that gets me up in the morning is, what is it about the brain that changes during development that allows visual performance to improve from basically the level of finger counting, you know, barely distinguishing different elements and uh, images in, in the world around the baby, to over the course of in humans, the first oh, three to five years after birth, that they become so visually sophisticated um, that they can extract all of the information from the visual world that they need. And so the, in a nutshell, what is it that's immature in the brain in babies that limits their performance and what changes during development that allows them to develop normal adult vision? Thanks. That's really fascinating, actually, about the visual development of humans. Are there any translational implications for your findings? Yeah, there are lots, actually. One of the main issues that I focus on is a developmental disorder called amblyopia. Amblyopia is a, basically a loss of vision in one eye that results from something like crossed eyes. It's, the technical name is strabismus. Um, or blur in one eye, or even a cataract uh, that a baby might be born with. And what happens during development is that if you have abnormal vision through one or both eyes, then the brain doesn't develop normally. And so I'm interested in what goes wrong with the developmental process that actually makes it difficult for people to see after they have one of these disorders. And the, the particular translational implications of the work now is that I'm interested in the process of trying to improve vision in kids that actually have the disorder amblyopia. So this is a tricky problem. You may um, have seen or know a child that had to wear an eye patch or glasses or um, have their eye dilated all the time or, or something like that. These are common treatments for amblyopia. And the way they work is that what they try to do is penalize the better eye of the child and force them to use the eye that isn't as good. And that works if there's really good compliance, but it's tough on the child because the mom doesn't want to put a patch on the child and the child doesn't want to wear it and the kid sees them. And anyway, these are, these are not some things for a kid. And so one of the things that I'm trying to do based on the work in my lab over the last 10 or 15 years is to try to develop different kinds of protocols for treating kids that will be a lot easier on the kids and that will actually help improve their vision generally. And so those kinds of things are kind of video-based methods for um, helping kids learn how to use their less good eye, their amblyopic eye, and hopefully improve their vision so that they can see normally. Yeah, that'd be great. This is the topic of your presidential special lecture at SFN this year. What's the main takeaway you'd like us to get from your mm. talk? The main takeaway is that there's a puzzle. Um, and the puzzle is that when we look at the neural activity in the brains of young animals in particular, what we find is that the neural function is really quite good compared to the behavioral performance. So what that means in terms of a child is, as I said, young kids and babies see very poorly. They don't see the fine detail very well. But if you look at their neural activity, it's quite a bit better than what their ability to resolve spatial detail is. And so that's the basic puzzle. And what I'm trying to solve is why is there this mismatch between information that's available in the brain, but that the baby's not able to use it or that the young animal's not able to use it? 
the takeaway is that there are ways of thinking about neural activity that are different from just looking at the function of single neurons that may give us a better clue about what information is actually available in the brain and what some of these mechanisms are that actually limit performance. And what I think is going on is that there's a lot of the visual pathway that feeds forward to the motor output. So you see something in the world and the information comes into the eye and into the visual cortex and it starts to get processed and fed forward. And what my current hypothesis is, is that some of these downstream areas where the information gets forward, fed forward to, are actually sites of immaturity. So you can think of them as being kind of critical immaturities in the brain. And that maybe what's happening is that these downstream areas have a much longer developmental time course than maybe early areas in the visual system. And they need to be kind of trained up during development. So the visual experience may be driving the development of these downstream areas. And when you have abnormal vision, then those downstream areas don't develop properly. And so they don't, don't get the right information. You end up with a visual system that's not normal. And so that's kind of where we're at right now. And, and as I said, with discussing the translational ideas, is what I'd like to try to do is, is think of ways to intervene in that process to, you know, in a way, prevent the amblyopia from developing in the first place. Mm-hmm. So is amblyopia a result of the maturity of these downstream areas being much lower than it should be? That's the or... hypothesis, yeah, okay. because... Even in, so we have an animal model for amblyopia, and what we find in that model system is that kind of like the infant, the neural activity is much better than you would expect based on the loss of vision. And so, again, I have kind of converging evidence for the idea that there are limitations downstream, both in terms of normal development and that whatever that normal development mental process is, it's something that doesn't develop normally in amblyopia. Well, I look forward to hearing your whole talk at SFN. I'm excited to give it. Is amblyopia something you've been studying for a long time? Or when did you get interested in this particular topic? It's actually something that I became interested in when I first started graduate school. And it was kind of a serendipitous thing in a way. I was a graduate student at the University of Washington in Seattle, and I was studying visual development and just really a a freshly minted graduate student just started. And a woman faculty member in ophthalmology came by. I had met her early early on when I first arrived, but she came by the lab one day and she said her name was Jennifer Lund a a famous uh, neuroanatomist who's now retired. In any case, she came by and she said, we're going to be studying what she called squinty monkeys. It was an animal model for strabismus, this developmental disorder that I mentioned. Um, And what it basically is is crossed eyes. And she was interested in the effect that the strabismus was going to have on the development of the visual cortex in terms of the anatomy. And she knew that I was interested in, you know, behavioral studies of visual development. And she said, we're going to be studying these animals. And if you'd like to do anything to test them while they're growing up, feel free. And so I thought, okay, I don't know anything about this. But I went off to the library. Back in the day, we used to go back to the library whenever we wanted to know something. (laughs) Um, Now you can just go on the web. But anyway, I went off to the library and I spent some time researching strabismus and what was known about its effect on the visual system. I discovered this problem called amblyopia. And I thought, well, okay, I can test their development of visual acuity since they're going to be here for some months. And I'll test each eye separately and see if anything happens. Because 
At the time, the clinical field knew that amblyopia was associated with strabismus, but there was no information about whether the amblyopia preceded the strabismus or was a consequence of it. And so I thought, okay, well, I'll just test them and see what happens. It was so cool for me to see this because what happened was after the strabismus was created by the ophthalmologist, I tracked the development of vision in each eye. For a while, visual acuity developed in parallel in each eye. And then after a week or two, in one case three weeks, the acuity in one eye started to lag behind the development of acuity in the other eye. And the longer I tracked them, what I actually saw was the development in real time of amblyopia in these animals. And so I thought it was so cool. And I wrote up the data and I sent it off to Vision Research and I published it. And that was my first experience with amblyopia. And it actually started my life's research. That's great. Thanks for sharing. It is kind of funny how people seem to fall into the area of research where they end up finding a whole lot of passion and interest. Yeah, it it really changed my life. Do you have a favorite memory from grad school? I have a lot of memories from grad school, but I actually think that the story I just told you is probably a a favorite Mm -hmm. memory because, you know, it really had such an impact on on me and the way I thought about development. And, you know, it really introduced me to a lot of new people and the new ideas and allowed me to keep a real clinical focus on my work. And that's something that's very important to me. I want the work that I do to be relevant to kids and to really be helpful for people. And so, um, for me, that was an extremely important uh, experience. Mm-hmm. So then when you were an undergraduate student, did you want to go into medicine or did you know that you wanted to do science? What was the motivation? <laughs> That's kind of interesting, too. Um, as an undergraduate, I actually started out in engineering. I thought I wanted to be a chemical engineer. I really loved chemistry, and I thought, engineering was so cool because you could figure out how things worked and design stuff. And I I really liked things like that. And um, back when I started college, women were not a regular presence in engineering. And what I discovered when I got to college um, and started taking classes in engineering was that not only were we way underrepresented, uh, we were really not welcome. It was really pretty unpleasant. So after a while, about a year and a half, I actually decided to change my major. And um, I spent some time thinking about what it was I wanted to do. I talked to a couple different counselors because I didn't really know. One of them pointed me to a field that was a kind of a precursor of neuroscience, which is called physiological psychology. And it was a field that was devoted to the study of brain and behavior. And so I thought, okay, well, that sounds pretty interesting. And I went off and took some courses and talked to some faculty. And one of them invited me to join their lab. And that was a real life changer for me. Because as soon as I started working in the lab, I realized that this is what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. I just wanted to do research. I wanted to do science. It was really fun. And it's a thing that's gotten me up in the morning ever since. That's wonderful. It was yeah, kind of I'm like a real, an aha moment. It really was. And to give back, I've spent a lot of time working with undergraduates in research and facilitating undergraduates getting involved in research. For some years, I uh, ran an undergraduate research program in the summer, and I'm still committed to that kind of thing because it was such a life changer for me. So how was your career trajectory after grad school? Did you do a postdoc? Where did you do it? I I did a a short postdoc, about three years, with a woman called Anita Hendrickson, uh, also at the University of Washington. I stayed there because I actually had some grant funding to do some more work with strabismus and amblyopia. 
and I had gotten connected through a collaboration uh, with Anita Hendrickson, and she's also an anatomist, a, a very, you know, she's, she's basically done the most beautiful work on the development of the retina and uh, LGN and visual cortex. She's just an amazing neuroanatomist, neuroscientist. Um, I've been lucky to have a number of really stellar women mentors, Jenny, Anita, and, and my own mentor, Davida Teller. I was really lucky to have them as inspiration. But in any case, Anita took me on as a postdoc, and I did some cortical neuroanatomy with her. And it was great because it was relevant to the things that I was working on anyway. And so it was a nice adjunct to the work I was doing for the grant that I had. And then I actually got married and <laughs> um, had a child. And my then husband got a job in New York. So I thought, okay, well, this is interesting. What do we do now? So I had a colleague at NYU called Tony Moshin, who I had also talked about collaborating with on, on a number of occasions. And so I called to see if there was any opportunity for me to, with my own funding, come to NYU. And so over the course of, you know, some months, uh, we worked this out and a variety of, of kind of serendipitous happening allowed me to actually set up my own lab at NYU. And I got my own funding and I had a research faculty position. And that was great. I was, it, it was fabulous. I had my own lab. I had my research going on. I had my own funding so then another odd thing happened, which was that the psychology department, which was where my appointment was, asked if they needed somebody to teach introduction to psychology. And since I was a research faculty member and I was in their department, they kind of said, would you do this? And I kind of felt like, well, okay, yeah, sure. So I started teaching introductory psychology for them. I guess I did a good job because they kept asking me to do it and I kept getting good reviews from the students. And after a while, I thought, well, this is taking away too much time from my research, and what I really want to do is research. So I said, you know what? I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm really sorry. It's been fun, but I'm just going to do my research. And then about a year later, they said, we have a faculty position that we would like to offer you, but we would like you to teach introduction to psychology. <laughs> um, so by actually telling them I didn't want to do it anymore, and they wanted me to continue to do it, they offered me a faculty position, and that happened to be coincidental with the development of the Center for Neuroscience uh, at NYU. So one thing led to another, and I became one of the founding faculty members in the Center for Neuroscience, and that's how I got my faculty job. <laughs> mm -hmm. So really kind of, um, again, it's one of those things that's non-conventional, but I think the moral of the story is you kind of see what life throws at you and you take what opportunities come your way and make the best of them. I think that's perfect advice. Switching gears a little bit, looking at the field of neuroscience as a whole, mm -hmm. um, is there a particular neuroscientist you admire most? One of my heroes is Torsten Diesel. Torsten was somebody who was very inspirational to me and his, his early work with, with David Hubel on uh, development of the visual system and the effect of visual experience on the development of the visual system. And Torsten has been somebody who's been, you know, in a way kind of an advisor to me over the years. He's a very generous person and is very active in mentoring young people. I kind of called him out of the blue one day when I was still in Seattle and, and asked him some questions about his work. He spent a long time with me on the phone, giving me advice. I actually talked to him at one point about a postdoc opportunity. He was happy to meet with me. He's just a wonderful, warm person and a stellar neuroscientist that really changed the field. You know, he, he taught us so much, he and, and Hubel together, taught us so much about the visual system and, and visual development and really started a whole field of, of uh, research into visual plasticity and cortical plasticity that has just really changed neuroscience. So, yeah, he's a real big hero of mine. Oh, thanks for sharing. 
So now we'd like to uh, learn a little bit more about you. So okay. If you weren't a neuroscientist, what do you think you would be? When people ask me what I'd be doing if I wasn't in the lab, um, I tell them I'd be an organic farmer. Oh. I'm probably not what you expect, um, but it's true. I would probably be an organic farmer. I probably, after science, I get the most passion out of growing things and raising things. I love working with animals. Um, I love working with plants. Um, I love nothing better than watching a garden grow. And I think I would be a farmer. I actually am the co-owner of what used to be a, a working farm, a dairy farm that was in my family. And my brothers and I took it over after my aunt and uncle passed away. And we've renovated the farm. And, you know, if I ever retire, I probably will go back to the farm. Do you have a, a yard right now where you have a really nice garden? It's in Vermont. Unfortunately, it's a little far oh. away from uh, New York. But I have things growing on my terrace in New York. And I have things growing in the yard in the farm in Vermont. Although not you now, it's cold. You need to teach cold. me something because I killed a strawberry plant and it, it was doing so well. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, strawberries are a little bit sensitive. You need to have the right balance of chemicals in the soil and oh. any chemicals in the sense of, uh, you know, acidity and, and things like that. I love yeah, that you just of... described it as a chemist. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, how funny. Yeah, I, when I was in high school, I was sure I was going to be a chemist or a chemical engineer. I just loved it. <laughs> it's so far from what I do now. Oh, but it's still there. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. How funny that you picked that up. <laughs> anyway, yes, I would be an organic farmer. All right, well, we're coming to the end of the interview, and I just wanted to ask you some lightning round questions. These are really quick questions, but your answers don't have to be short if you don't want them to be. But okay. It's kind of fun when they're snappy. Okay. Coffee or tea? Coffee. Go-to comfort food? Mac and cheese. Hidden talent? Understanding behavior. What is your favorite book? Hmm, that's a tough one. I have a lot of favorite books. I love mysteries. Anything written by P.D. James. What gadget can you not live without? A corkscrew. <laughs> <laughs> Where would you like to visit but haven't been yet? The Galapagos. If you could choose one person to dine with, dead or alive, who would it be? Charles Darwin. All right, those are all the questions I have for you. Uh, Lynn, okay. is there anything else you would like to add? No, maybe just, well, yes. If science is your passion, do anything you can to make sure that you can do that. I love that. Thank you for ending with such superb advice and such uplifting words. Go for your passion. Yep, that's what you got to do. Anyway. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lynn. It was a pleasure You're speaking welcome. with you. And you too. Well, that concludes this special edition of Knowing Neurons. Don't miss Lynn's talk on Sunday, November 13th at 5 p.m. at the Society for Neuroscience annual meeting in San Diego. I'll see you there. <laughs>